everyone. Uh, today's uh, 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 panel or presentation or a celebration and a book launching uh, in relation to Ibrahim's work uh, will be highly informal. Uh, Ibrahim will talk about his work. And I do have a part presentation that actually uh, uh, relate to how the retrospective exhibition, which is actually celebrated here today, but is also uh, documented in the uh, book that you will see uh, later on, uh, which is available now uh, at the table outside. Um, the, the, the slide presentation is organized in a way, in, in, in the same way that the show was organized. It will give you some idea of how the show itself has been curated, divided into different sections. Uh, Ibrahim's life is really highly complex, and it's not easy to put in one retrospective. He needs several actual retrospectives. Uh, so let me just read a, a short statement that will contextualize the work uh, uh, of Ibrahim. Uh, he is, in my view, one of the most influential figures in Sudanese art and modern art. Uh, through his extraordinary artwork and remarkable writing and art criticism, you have to understand he's also a great writer. Uh, his memoirs actually is, is coming out soon. Uh, will be published in Sudan and Cairo. Uh, through his extraordinary artwork and remarkable writings and art criticism, Ibrahim has made foundational contribution to the modernist movement in Africa and in the Arab world. In his paintings, drawings, and illustrations, he engages with an array of traditional African, Arab, and Islamic visual sources, as well as European uh, art movement. His unique style transcends geographic and cultural boundaries and has inspired artists in Sudan and elsewhere in Africa for generations. So you have to understand that Rahim, just to give you an example, he has been in Nigeria in, 19, uh, in the 1960s with figures like Jacob Lawrence, who's a well-known African-American artist for some of you who don't know, and uh, Dennis Williams uh, from Trinidad, and uh, many of the artists that we know today or figures uh, as part of the Imbare Club, where he went there around workshop with Uli Bayer. So figures like Wole Shoinka, Chinua Achebe, and all of those people have been part of that kind of workshop. Of course, at that time, they were young. Now, they are uh, featured in, in great shows, but it's also in uh, uh, awards and uh, being awarded many uh, accolades and, 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 and fellowships. al he was born in 1930 in Ongerman, Sudan, to a prominent family with long history of Islamic scholarship and activism. His formal education began at his father's Quranic school, known in Sudan as Halwa, and his art training at the School of Design at Gordon Memorial College, which is now uh, College of Fine and Applied Art uh, in Khartoum. In 1954, he left the country for a government scholarship to study at the prestigious Slade School of Fine Art in London, where he became acquainted with Western modernism. Upon his return to Sudan, he emerged as a leader in the Khartoum movement, a modernist art movement focused on deconstructing Sudanese visual motifs and then reforming the constitutional part to suggest a new culture and aesthetic uh, and identity and visual vocabulary. And Ibrahim is very fundamental and foundational in the creation of that kind of movement. Our solid art, and in my view, offers a profound possibilities for understanding African Arab and Arab modernism and repositioning them within the context of a broader global modernity. Uh, this career retrospective that I, that I refer to uh, brings together, uh, just to give you an idea, more than five decades of Ibrahim work. I mean, the work that we, know that we want to feature is perhaps more than 120 works uh, that range from work on paper to, uh, uh, to huge uh, paintings to, to almost mural uh, size uh, type of painting. Uh, and the show and Annika of traces that journey, which originated in Sudan and led to the artist international schooling, uh, his detention, which is also very important to understand as part of his career, that he was a political prisoner uh, in Sudan during the military dictatorship uh, in uh, the 1970s. Then he kind of moved into what can be uh, what can be uh, uh, named as self-imposed exile in Qatar, and then now. Uh, in the UK where he now resides in Oxford. Uh, as we say in Sudan, the song is sweeter in the mouth of, of his own uh, composer. So 
Uh, with this, I leave uh, the platform to Ibrahim. Uh, he, he will offer some reflections on his life and career from Sudan uh, to the present. And then we will follow up with the uh, uh, slide presentation that will give you some, will walk you through uh, some uh, aspect of the uh, exhibit itself, although you need to see. And uh, if I may just mention one uh, last point is that Ibrahim is not just making history in terms of establishing movement being very uh, important in the, in the formation of African modernism, Ibrahim uh, will go into history as the first African Arab Muslim in Western Union to be featured in a retrospective at the Tate Modern. Uh, and I think that is uh, in itself a, a very major victory for, for those of us who work in the field. Not that we want it to be legitimized by uh, centers of legitimation as they call them in the West, but that in itself, the victory is that it's changing the art historical narrative itself from a very narrow Eurocentric one to a much global one. And it, it, it is Ibrahim work, it is him, it is his life, his, his career, his, his accomplishment that forced that kind of uh, opening uh, that I'm sure will follow uh, as the Tate Initiative, as a leading uh, 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 institution uh, in modern art. Uh, that will open up the door to many other artists. So with this, please join me in welcoming Brian Islam. aspects of my work, and it seems to me now, <laughs> and to show you some examples, a few examples of the stages of my development, of the development of my work as the work of a picture maker. And I call myself just a picture maker, like uh, anyone having a tree, and he went a little bit about it and have to go about it. Uh, I hope you will excuse me if I sneeze or cough because a few days ago, since I came, I caught a bug or a bug caught me, I don't know which is which, but kept me in, in bed for some time until Professor Salah got me a, a strong boost in the antibiotics that made me regain my voice again and get out of bed after I thought that I might not make it this evening. Before I start, maybe it's better just to give you um, a very, very brief account of my uh, art training from childhood till now, because I'm still learning and still carrying on. As you Farah mentioned, I'm now 82, but my mother told me that I was sent to school, to a Quranic school, at the age of two. In that school, which my father established in front of our house, so I didn't have to, to go far away. And it's uh, that period where I spent five years, from two to still five, as a, a young boy. The one thing that I remember very well indeed, which affected my work later on, 
is the fact that we used to, everyone learned a few um, chapters of the Quran. You have to celebrate and decorate your wooden slate with a decorative uh, pattern, the motifs, which uh, look like a frieze in um, manuscripts. And inside you write the letters of the last uh, chapter that we have learned. Uh, no other form at all, but that taught me a great deal about calligraphy, about the precision of space and the light and so on. And then the British in, uh, introduced a new system of education which was uh, three, uh, three periods. The first elementary goes for four years, and there was no art training in it at all except calligraphy. The second period, which is called the intermediate school, and that was for another four years. And this period, I remember there was also no art training at all except calligraphy again. And I never forget from that period in a friend of ours, a period for art or any sort of creative uh, act is limited to the extent that only when a teacher is missing from coming to give his uh, lecture, is that they have someone to fill in. And I remember the one whom I didn't remember his name very well called Ahmed Babikar. He used to come with a book that he dips his head in it and he never looks at anyone at all. And a student beside me, a colleague, raised his hand, Mr. Mr. Sir, Sir, could I, what should I draw? Draw anything. And then he says, could I draw a, a razor blade? And one of those Gillette razor blades with the, uh, with the hole inside and he has his pencil around it. When he finishes, Sir, Sir, may, may I shade it with my pencil? He said, yeah, 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 yeah. He said, shade it. Sir, I finish. What should I, else should I do? And he says, uh, do anything. Can I make another razor blade? Oh, that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> anyway. This is how it used to be. I remember at that time, I used to color the textbooks that had pictures in them. And I was frightened to death of being discovered because at the end of the year, they might take the year, collect, they collect the books they issued us. And that was it for the whole period, nothing except something, self-dependency in making up. The third period, which is the secondary, before going to college or university or any higher institute of education. They have uh, art introduced as part of the curriculum and because it's exam had an examination at the end of the year for the general certificate of education in Sudan. There I found I have been helped a great deal by a teacher. He was a Welshman called uh, Mr. Davis. And he took care of my work and myself and helped me a great deal until I went to the next step of joining the art college, which was called the School of Design in Khartoum. That was a place where it was fantastic because it was run by a, a philosopher called John Pierre Greenwell, who established the college. And he taught us to be observant, to, nature, to watch nature the human form. Every detail has got to be crystal clear and you have to, in a way, to prove that you are a draftsman or a draftswoman. Uh, after that, I went to the state as uh, Professor Salah Nation, where I, uh, doors opened in front of me to find out uh, things. I studied art history, anatomy, visual perception, perspective, the law of vision, and that led me to fall in love with Johnson in the period before the Renaissance, and that uh, I attended a course of the background of the Renaissance in the British Institute of Florence, which gave me a chance to understand what was happening and why the change had got to take place from the Gothic into the Renaissance kind of opening into the vision and the third dimension and 
so on. I also studied at Cape Cod about Alberti, Dizak, and Brunelleschi, who established the theoretical aspects of perspective, and so on. Also in this lead, I joined quite a number of uh, societies and things. I was very keen on dancing. And I thought someone said to me, why don't you change your study and study dancing instead of, of, uh, of art? I said, well, this I can do it on my own. I don't need any kind of study because I depend on the rhythm. And the, anyway, so uh, at the stage, I with Giotto, as I was so keen on discovering what made him tick and what he achieved in his work at the Basilica of San Francesco in Assisi. But I had to go to follow his school of Giotto all over. The, uh, uh, that part of Italy, and I went all around bordering on uh, uh, Ravenna at the mosaics and coming down up to Vieto, very near Rome. And that taught me a great deal to see the thing. But later on, I uh, turned away from Giotto because I thought about the, very carefully about the third dimension of a picture. That is uh, an imaginable thing because the picture has only got two dimensions. It's just the length and the breadth. That kind of is an illusion. So how can I preserve that element of third dimension while at the same time obeying the rule of the material I'm using, which is the two dimensional. So this kind of took me some time to get to something. One of the pieces, I hope it will be in the uh, presentation uh, images, about the church on a hill. And that, I can't combine the physical nature, physical appearance of the building with the space before it into the picture plane and so on. A few kind of technical things which took some time. After the slave, I came to the States here in 62 and 64, 65, where I had a chance to visit as many art colleges, art schools, museums, and so on, you name it. And I traveled through so many uh, states in the United States, met artists, joined the uh, aspiring group of black artists in, in Harlem, and so on. So I was hoping to learn as much as I could also because I had within me is a very inquisitive child who doesn't seem to grow at all. Right now, because of uh, the age and so on, I haven't got the legs for it. But anyway, it keeps on dying continuously, wanting me to travel around, to meet people, and so on. I went to China way back in 1958. And I learned a great deal of how they think about life, how they think about art, and the art should serve the community and so on. Then I came to it during my second visit to America, which was in 54, 64, 65. I had a chance to study photography at Columbia University. And I did it for one year. At the same time, I learned, tried to, to learn etch, etching and uh, printmaking with uh, Bob Blackburn, the artist here. Uh, I know he uh, passed away, made me rest in peace. So anyway, this is how things go. One of the things when I had to go back to Sudan, I was uh, uh, asked to join a kind of uh, an administrative kind of uh, organization by the Sudanese Academy for Administrative uh, Sciences. And that put me in a different kind of uh, sphere, which is far away from what I believe in or what I practice. Anyway, that was that. Uh, the thing is that for an artist, I always believe that the artist, having out of his life since childhood, he has taken a great deal from the community, from the culture, from the heritage, local heritage that he knows and he grew up in. And that has got to 
be paid back in kind. I believe that there has to be a bridge between the artist and the community. I remember when I came back from uh, England and I sent my work, whatever I've been doing, I was very keen on portraiture, uh, landscape, still lives, and so on. And uh, so I thought of having an exhibition. So I had one big exhibition for all the works I brought from England. People came the first day and they had the soft drinks which are offered free. And then they left. They never came again. Second day, I mean, only, only my students in the art college and my colleagues came just to pass time. And then they're gone. The same thing. I had another exhibition, the same thing happened. A third exhibition, the same thing happened. This created a question and a query in my mind. What happened to them? Where is in their memory? And the genes of their memory? Where is the past of Kush, of Maryland, of the kingdoms, the Christian kingdoms we had in the Sudan? We've been Christian for a thousand years. And that is from the 6th century to the 16th century. We had three, three kingdoms, uh, 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 Nomadia <coughs> in the north, bordering with Egypt, and then Mubarra in northern Sudan, and Alwa, which is next to Khartoum, and even up to the south Khartoum, where they had churches, and they had uh, basilicas, and they had uh, uh, murals, and so on. Where has that gone in the memory? Then this made me query, this query took me to discover what do they have, what do we have? Because so far they are not coming here in any way. I found that when I pass through housing, this the school where I was teaching art college, they had the winter trips to all over the Sudan to, to see the nature, the people, the trades, whatever it is. And this I traveled and sometimes I did to my own to discover what people have in their homes, what makes sense to them aesthetically. And I found to my ignorance before, think that we had and we have been living through all our lives and I never realized the values in it, the aesthetic values in it. And this was Arabic calligraphy and motive, the African motifs and sense of decoration, which is all over the house. Then I thought, why not try to use it as a sort of an eye catcher to the people and see the response. So I used Arabic calligraphy with words which I took from what they had in their homes, mostly uh, either some verses from the Quran or poetry or words of wisdom or saints. And I used one, I remember the first one I used, I used the word Allah, God, just at the right hand top corner of a painting. And that nothing to do with the content of the work itself. And that this had been recognized and people can say Allah. Then looking at it, next step, I added more words and they came nearer and they came nearer. Then I got to discover what is there that attracts them. And I found that there it was the origin the, this uh, abstract symbol, which is the Arabic calligraphy, that I had to break it down, the forms of the letter, and see what's in it. And what came out to me almost all was like the Padura box, because it came out plant forms, human form, sound, uh, images, which I, I, I don't know where they come from. Then I had to regroup them again into a solid form and take it from there. Strange enough, I found the meaning because apparently 
the society in general was concerned with certain things and the fact that they had the word, the written word, means a picture. Because as I followed it and made lots of queries and questioning and so on, apparently a letter, a letter beside a letter makes a word. A word beside another word makes a line. A line beside a line makes a page. A page is an illuminated picture. So here, the transfer of the written word and what it means goes into their mind as a full picture. And this, I thought, what I thought they lacked, they had an alternative, which could just be exactly the same as far as the setting values are concerned. And that I took it from there. Until today, my work is mostly dependent on the rhythm of the Arabic calligraphy and the sense of decoration, the decorative element in the African motifs. Sorry, I, I went a bit longer than I meant to, to, to go about this, but maybe now we can see some of the images that shows my early beginnings of work. Yes. 
this one, what uh, I learned from Jonto for a long time, to think about the third dimension and the law of vision, and how I revolted against that later on, by trying to work on the image at distance to keep it as clear as possible. At the same time, to come to the foreground of the picture and work on it in a way which is, it is gradually going backward, but not like having the orthogonals and the vanishing points, the 90 degrees and the 25, 45 degrees of the side. That kind of, of uh, geometry I've dispensed with and tried just to relate the areas of the paint to the actual, uh, we call it in Arabic, uh, and Muslim, means the thing on which you lean the, the, uh, the, the color. And that's, uh, I think it, it works. It gives a sense of space, and at the same time, it's completely abstract, part of it, except the top part. Portraits from the yes. inside, the modern society, yes. same here. Yeah. And the period after that is a period that we, we it's, a, it's a whole a part of the uh, exhibit that we call meditation and mastery. That's a period after the return from the slave teaching at the school uh, of fine arts in Khartoum, and uh, also, uh, as he said, being part of the bureaucratic structure uh, as a member of the uh, uh, Ministry of Culture. This is uh, one of the masterpieces from the pier, uh, which is the piece that I guess acquired by the table. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's now featured if you're in London to see. Yes, a drawing that can give you some sense of what Ibrahim talked about, using the use of Arabic calligraphy, as you can see from the right there, mm -hmm. in a style that is uh, uh, totally different than seen before. It's interesting if you see, if you see the drawings of Wangechi Mutu, who's a very contemporary Kenyan artist. You will see a little thing of that kind of style of drawing. Surprises, just check uh, the work of one Gechi Muda. You'll see that Brandon did this almost 40 years ago. Uh, that's also a, 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 a typical, of course, city portrait, modernist one, from that period, but it was, uh, 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 it has a long story behind it, but it was, it was, it was a, portrait that, a portrait that was commissioned. Uh, by uh, a fellow named uh, John uh, McKelty, who used to be a head of the agriculture division at the, Ford Fund, at the Rockefeller Foundation, and he asked Brian to do his uh, portrait, uh, sorry, the portrait of his wife. And so you could just say a few words about the portrait. Yeah. 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 Apparently, he commissioned me to do a painting of his wife, as Professor Sarah said. But he was expecting something like Picasso. He said they wanted to make the nose on her ear and her ear on her forehead. And they said and so on. But I, I found that because the woman was such a nice person, and she wanted something to represent, to, to leave behind, for she passed away now, to leave her, uh, behind for her uh, family and so on. So I made it as such. But the thing in the background, I, I don't think it could be here. But I asked the whole family to come to join in this work and put their mark and write whatever they want to write in the background. Then I make it up as a kind of a background, keeping its space on it. And this is what happened. Australia, so, you know, for a long time, we didn't know where he was because he was working for the Rockefeller Foundation, when I, which I had my scholarship, second scholarship in America. And then he disappeared. We didn't know where he was. But uh, Professor Sabah, which is very inquisitive, almost like a, an, 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 an artist uh, detective, he found exactly when he was and we were going to meet him. And we found that the, the chair which I painted her on was there in their house and the painting was hanging in front of, on top of the, of the chair, which was rather, rather sweet. It's one of those interesting stories of research, actually, uh, when you kind of pursue this kind of uh, artist like Ibrahim and try to discover. One aspect of it that is interesting to me is that when I show this piece to the Museum of African Art, which is the organizing uh, museum, they literally didn't want it. Because I thought it was just familiar, uh, typical uh, kind of a school uh, 
uh, school in Cairo, you know, in, in Western uh, city politics. But what they didn't know is the story behind it. It's how Ibrahim, that, that it is a portrait that Ibrahim actually had, had an impact on it by incorporating the letter in the background. And by erasing, just making it a background that is not necessarily like a city portrait with a typical background that you see. It was in dialogue with the family, with the, with the city person too, but incorporating calligraphy in the same style that he plays in the uh, Arab world, deconstructing it in the Arabic style. So that's the kind of aspect of, of modernism that he, even in moments when the word looks familiar uh, as, as, as Western, that you find that there are elements in it that are very important to look at. This is a piece that's called, uh, uh, is that the two? Sorry, for yeah, yeah, this is the, 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 um, the mosque. The mosque. And that's the one that is at the moment? But that's the one acquired by the mosque yeah. in, in the fields. Uh, and this is the kind of style that Ibrahim uh, uh, involved. And this piece is at the, uh, it is at the uh, Johnson Museum here. It's called Funeral and the Crescent. And it was then uh, a commemoration of the memory of uh, Patrice Lumumba, which is also, as I said, it's a, it's a surprise to many people that when they discovered that African artists at the time are, are not necessarily just immersed in their work, but they were really very aware of, of what is happening around them and very immersed in activism. And in, and that, that they pursued that through the world. So this is a very important piece politically because of the event itself of the uh, assassination of Patrice uh, Lumumba. But it was also important in terms of the development of a totally new visual language that, that were really, at the time, very novel. You will see a lot of people now doing it. But, uh, but, but of course, a lot of people draw similarities to Vinat Picasso, or they mentioned uh, 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 Fred Lam, Fred Lam in Cuba, who, uh, you know, Ibrahim knew his work, Ibrahim was in Paris, so there are also very interesting and intersecting stories. Uh, Ibrahim also did a lot of self portraits, which are actually, I, I decided to, to, to uh, add some of them here. Uh, so if you recall the title of this one, uh, just uh, the title, it was called the Fear, something like that. So, yeah. uh, and these are just a sample of his drawings, which are really uh, uh, amazing. And so that, and then the step, sorry for him, I'm just going quickly because just be mindful of time. If you have any comments that you want to make, yes, please go ahead. Just about the uh, representation, uh, I mean, the naturalistic kind of form of art that one does. I never forget the time when I went back from the state and there was such a pompous one and conceited and said that I could paint like Leonardo da Vinci, just give me the, the models and give me the uh, support. The financial support, and I could make this and that and so on. But then they changed. I came to my senses. I realized that the whole thing. Because a great deal, it needs a lot of uh, uh, support from this and that. They had the church and they had the rich people there. And there was a living uh, culture going behind. While there, I was living in a place which is uh, semi desert and there's uh, anyway, that kind of thing. But these changes had to happen continuously, in spite of the acquired experience in picture making, but one keeps changing continuously, because I never wanted to get stuck and be petrified by a certain style or something. Later on, I changed, and as uh, was the So the period after that in the show itself, even though the show has some issues for, for special work that we have, and it's not necessarily follow a historical uh, narration, but it was also thematic at the same time. So this is a period that we call in prison expatriation and exile. Ibrahim in 1975, uh, 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 there was a military coup, and in the aftermath of that failed coup, Ibrahim used to be at the, at the time the deputy minister of Russia. And, uh, and to refer to him, he actually uh, uh, did a lot in terms of organizing the Department of Culture. It's an experience that he talks about in his memoir that is actually very fascinating for people like me who at the time view with suspicion any collaborations with that government. But Ibrahim definitely, and the way he impacted the Minister of Culture uh, would never be the same uh, uh, for anybody who comes uh, after him. Uh, but of course, that was all destroyed by the current military regime. We seem to be uh, cursed by one military group after the other. So, 
after his imprisonment, uh, which is actually a fascinating period that we focus a whole way of the exhibit, uh, you know, on, on, on part of his work that he actually did, uh, which we call the physiognomy. He did some sketches that are really beautiful. I'll show you samples of those later on. But this is the people where he left, went to Qatar, and, 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 uh, and then uh, after that, of course, England, and he, he did come back for, for a short period, but there was a period where he turned completely into painting. Not necessarily completely, but painting mostly in black and white, uh, of, of a style that he called uh, uh, um, uh, organic gross. gross. Uh, but he works with pen and ink, uh, and some of you who may have seen his work at the Johnson Museum are probably familiar with this. You know. So they're fascinating style of painting. And Ibrahim, I'll just run through them in the same way you want to do about it. But, but the movement towards black and white happened after prison. Uh, but of course, from an art historical perspective, as our child has to art historian to make sense of all that kind of case of the team and canonize it in some form, uh, the influence of the, uh, uh, the spider may have been there. Ibrahim may contest this because they painted it black and white. Uh, his visit to Mexico. Uh, the largest style, mural line of his work, is very similar to a lot of Mexican muralists, uh, and so forth. But Ibrahim could reflect on that, and I will show some of the work uh, as we go along. Ibrahim? Uh, apparently, when I was uh, in the government uh, hospitality in the Sudan, which was quite an experience, and not all of it was that bad. It was bad enough to be in, but inside something else happens. I remember we used to, we're not, we've been deprived of having food from our homes and the food we had was inedible. And so by the time when they allowed us to have food, it was brought in from our homes in paper, uh, paper which was cement casing and made into a kind of a, a plastic bag, a bag like plastic bag. And anyone in jail who had was found to have paper and a pencil, then they put us in uh, solitary confinement for 15 days. And there was a small pencil that we had that we used to use, and then with a little, I, I cut the paper into smaller pieces, and I used to hide it, uh, hide it in, uh, in the sand in front of the, of the, of the cell. And then I, I had the idea, as it had to be very tiny, so I added a little piece, another piece of the same size to the left, another piece to the right, another piece above, another piece below. And that started growing almost like a plant, like a creeper, growing from, from, a, from a germ, from a seed. But it, in my mind, it presents something which I am part of. I read the half particle and the whole, the individual and society, and so on. This as I did in pencil when I came out, I did mostly in black and white. And I was trying to find out the link between the two contrasting elements that we cover, the black and the whiteness of the paper. So I tried to discover the gray tone in between. And this gray tone is the link, which the same thing as I was thinking about the artists and, and the viewers and the public, the same thing I was dealing with dealing with the gray tone. I did it in such a way to keep the ground, which was white, alive. I took into cross-hatching. With the cross-hatching, I, I, I narrowed it in such a way that the cross-hatching fits into almost solid black. But the little tiny little dots, you can see it with the enlarger, that they're there to keep the paper alive. I never wanted to kill anything. Enough killing in the world. So I am not going to be one of them. Anyway, this resulted into a series of work. Many times I come back to it because I was thinking the same thing as I had with that course of photography I had in, in, in Colombia of verbalization of the picture in black and white. And that was a very interesting kind of uh, research work and how to, to explain and how to understand a picture by its basic elements of light and shade. And this is the same. So I carry on. Now I came back 
though I had a visit to uh, Spain, I've been invited to show some, to make a visit and to see it. And uh, almost like the Arabs coming back to, to Spain, quite a dream. Anyway, I, I, I did large works, huge, and uh, I've been still working, just finished some last month, and all the done in black and white. What I found with black and white, it uh, extenuates and uh, it sort of feeds the sense of drama in the picture, which I wanted to, to preserve. I just a few words on the organic ones, because the idea of how you yes. build up is a huge number of life. This piece, by the way, is in the uh, collection of the Johnson Museum. Yes. yes. I, I had uh, each, each piece, as I said earlier, that I wanted to preserve the relationship between the individual and the society, between the public and the whole, that I thought, why don't I have each piece in itself can function by itself like an individual in a society, individual, separate from anyone else. Yet together they create a society. And I hope it will be a harmonious society, in spite of the fact that I'm using contrasting elements in it. So here, as you see, all these I work them as separate, but I guess make sort of a register to follow to the next one according to the uh, organic growth of a picture. I have no idea when I start the picture, except at the back of my mind, what it's going to look like and what it's all about. But what happens is that as it grows, then it tells me. And I'm one of those crazy people who talk to the picture <laughs> and listen to it. And they tell me exactly, take this away from me, add something here, take this away, and so forth. Until it takes shape, then towards the end it says to me, go home. I have nothing more to do. Just leave me alone. And that's when I find that it's finished. And that's the time when I sign it and put the paper. And these are just examples. I mean, it's very really small, like the really large mural like size you know, to smaller pieces and even portraits. And this is one of the portraits from the view. So is that what you think you can say something about it? Yes. Well this is just it's a very tiny small one. I did it and then I saw it was well, looked like Picasso to me looking out of the window. And uh, he had a, a big bottle in front of him. So, well, how to link between the castle and the bottle and then call him in the cell? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and this? This, this one is very really interesting because I gave it the, the name of Halabi Mutasam al Nahar, that the gypsy in the mid, midday. Apparently, as children, there used to be someone who comes having kind of a very ripe fruit, guavas and bananas and so on. And goes there and he didn't have money. So he used to run up behind him and, and just have a whiff of this melody of the uh, ripe fruit. And so some of this is in the cover of the book. Yes. And this is just another example of that, that kind of series, black and white uh, drawings from that period. Which incorporates the Arabic calligraphy. These are he did a lot of he did a lot of illustrations of books uh, that are very important. And some of you may want to know that uh, you know Taif uh, Sak, the author of the season of migration to the north. Uh, one of his novels called Wedding of Zain. Ibrahim actually did the illustrations for those novels. Uh, he started in the first one was done in 1960. Mid 60s. So, and the period that we end up with, although, as I said, if we focus on some individual work in kind of an art, uh, it's a much more, uh, we, have, we have big space to the prison notebook to something called the bureaucratic suite and so forth. But this is the last period, which is uh, what we call a continuous spiritual journey. And the reason is because during this period, although this is considered from that period, this is actually a masterpiece as uh, commissioned by the, uh, by the, uh, and the World Foundation for the Museum for Art and Art. He accomplished this piece actually during one of his residences in Ithaca uh, in a studio that is offered by the College of Fine Arts, sorry, by the College of Architecture and Art uh, uh, in downtown. And, and it's really a huge piece. 
and hopefully some of you will see a show and see. Uh, and and you can say a few words about it before we get to the tree, right? Um, about this piece. No, it's just that uh, I think it speaks for itself. <laughs> but there is an element. It's like, yes, it's like one day I saw a woman. <laughs> Okay. 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 Yes. Uh, actually, I saw a woman, I couldn't tell when I, I showed it in the, in the garden. Because the woman was in the Sultan of Oman. And I saw kind of absolute power in the middle. And there were two people sitting next to him, behind him, a step behind him. And that kind of serenity and authority and heaviness and so on, I just stuck in my mind as something that I had got to get it out. One when they asked commission to do it, I, this thing came, I, and I guess overnight I had a dream, I had a vision of this thing into smaller size, of one in the middle and one on the left. But the other one I had to choose the one on the left to make it facing, to fit in with the one in the middle. And that's uh, awesome. But it, it's something just to show the, the absolute kind of authority of a, a, a person sitting on top of other people and really sort of dampening or really lacking. But I couldn't say that before. And uh, one of the series that we've been working on uh, lately is called The Tree. And uh, you may, may want to say something about The Tree. So yes. It's a very fascinating story. For me, it's actually it's symbolic of Ibrahim himself. But, uh, let's say, let's say, uh, it's very it's very say it's something about it. Yes. With The Tree, uh, there, there is a tree, an actual tree called Haraj that grows in the banks of, banks of the Nile. And this tree, during the flood season and the rainy season, is completely dry, bone dry. And during the drought and the hot season, it's in leaves and blossoms and fruit, completely different to what is there, as if there is a rejection of what is happening, a rejection against nature, against whatever is there. And it reminds me because that many times I was trying to get to express in my work the nature of the Sudanese of northern Sudan who live on the Nile banks, yet they retain their nomadic nature. They reject uh, easiness and easy life. They have a sort of a self-imposed poverty while they while they're able to make something. And that kind of nature is very, very solid, based possibly, possibly by the, by the religious sense of the Sufis who reject words and try to live with the least. They say in Arabic, and the Sufis repeat it many times, Al-Haja Rilq, that means need is slavery. So, Get away, get rid of. Uh, and I, I know that kind of mentality might be rather difficult for you here to understand fully what it means and how people can carry on with that type of, of uh, behavior. Again, it's not having that much, having very, very little. Hussein said that has the mind, look, I imagine, look in the sofa, that all that a uh, human being needs is a few bites of food just to keep him standing on his feet. That kind of mentality. I find it very hard, but I find it most fascinating. Or this sort of nomadic Sufi character in us, which kept us going all the time. Many people in the rest of the Arab world that believe that we are lazy because we do not cultivate the land as it should be. We are not using economics properly to gain more money and to have a better life and so on. Yet people prefer the simplicity. And with the simplicity, they believe the human soul will appear as clear as possible and grow. Okay, so thank you so much. With this, we end. Uh, Abraham's story is much more complex, so that's why uh, you must buy the book <laughs> so you can uh, read more about him. Uh, he, he was. Uh, can, can you channel my song, please? Uh, there is a chance if you want to ask him any questions. Uh, but I must say that he, he is really an avant-garde and a pioneer uh, uh, in many ways in Sudan. He acted in movies. He acted as a saint in a film that is based on the novel of Tlaib Saleh, that's called Wedding of Zain. And he has a lot of interesting, fascinating stories to tell about 
the film, the film itself, which was done by a Kuwaiti uh, filmmaker called Khaled Sidi. Uh, and he also, in the early days of the production of television in Sudan, had a whole show uh, based on role play, where he actually discussed a problem that he can address uh, like the problem, or at least one of the problems. <laughs> Uh, but but it is, it's a, we thought, uh, uh, it, we, we, he, you uh, recorded how many of that show? But it, it's very popular. The last it's been on for a long time. Yeah, it's called The House That Jack Built. Uh, Jack is just a popular character in Sudan. Uh, but what is fascinating is that Rahim took that as a, as a good uh, uh, title for a show about social problem, uh, discussing news problems, so many things. That was considered, we're talking 60s, 70s, that was considered really pioneer uh, of, of an artist or anybody to come and do that. And some of the issues that he, he discussed were really almost taboo um, in Sudanese society. And he was also a photographer, he did a lot of photographic work. Uh, unfortunately, I need a lot of convincing to convince the Museum of Africa now because they were really uh, into just economizing of how much they spend, is that there is a lot to show with Rahim, but hopefully with the work now with the uh, Tate Modern. All of these other aspects of the writing work will be shown. Okay, so but if you have a question or anything for writing, please feel free to do it <coughs> or to ask. Any questions? Yes. Um, Ibrahim, there there were two images um, that seemed to me at least to reflect Chinese calligraphy more than Arabic calligraphy. Were those after your trip to China? No, that, that was strange enough before. But I was trying to play around with the form. Mm -hmm. But not, not, not to, to imitate Chinese uh, characters. But they look very much sort of Chinese. Strange enough nowadays I have come back to the same thing. I'm just trying to use simple lines that can represent a human being, to represent movement, to represent some object which you can see in front of you and so on. I remember when I went to China, I've been very, very much impressed with the Chinese kind of uh, knowing how to treat, uh, how to use art, and how to use people. One of the things which I found in China is that I asked them, when they asked me, what do you, we spent a month between Peking and Shanghai, and I was asked, what do I want to, to see more? I said they want to visit as many art colleges and uh, art schools as possible. So they, they arranged for me a, a special program. And I went to visit them, visit different schools and so on. I found the staff in those colleges and universities and institutes a mixture of uh, professional academics and non-academics. I mean, uh, workers and traditional kind of craftsmen and so on working side by side with them. And that was, to me, was rather strange because for us academics and academic and uh, uh, another person to another person and so forth. So I asked them why. And they said, look here, we have to preserve our culture and our heritage. And we have to have the uh, staff, the academic staff, working side by side with the uh, skilled laborers, they gain the trade, they gain the knowledge of the trade, and with their scientific kind of approach, they can develop it more. At the same time, for the skilled laborers who can work side by side with the academics, he can learn new means, particularly with the trades which are dying out. They can uh, renovate and bring about something new in it, but the main thing is to preserve the culture. They said that uh, the, uh, all the colleges and uh, institutions, it goes for five years, this is I mean, uh, over uh, secondary school level. They have five, uh, uh, five years. The first two years are traditional, be it in engineering, in building, in medicine, whatever it is, and the three years contemporary. And that, that's what made them, in a short while, we, this time, we went in 1959, on the 10th anniversary of the uh, founding of the, uh, of the uh, Republic. And uh, that, that, ever since, now if you tell anything, 
you find it too many in China. then you know that something is not right, something has not to happen. So you keep working. I never like to crank it. Like if you have a car, it doesn't start, you have to crank it to start working. I don't. I work very naturally. And, but the thing is that I listen to the picture, and it can tell me that uh, certain things have got to be done, certain things have got to be changed. Now with black and white, I have to be very, very careful. Not a drop of ink is thrown on the white. That has to be very clear. Sometimes when it happens, then I have to incorporate it into the work itself. So no mistake is a mistake. But when it's finished, I have to rely on the, on the picture. Because I believe it has something to, to tell me that I have to respect. The same thing, I believe that the work is not finished until the viewer, the public comes in. Because I think they have a to the work. It's not only the work of the artist who will produce something and that's it. I believe that the work itself, as far as the viewer is concerned, is another step in the develop development of the work. And that's why many, many a time I find it difficult to give it a name. I leave the name to the viewers. They can see whatever they want to see, almost like a platform from which to spring and to understand what the message is all about. So, but I don't know. Okay, I have a question about the place that art plays in the African context today. Because we know that many countries are uh, instituting art uh, departments in the cabinet. But it seems that from what I know, that these departments are to be encouraged artists to produce for the outside world, so that for festival, for uh, curators, for museum, outside, I mean, in Europe. So I'm curious about what's your take on art and politics in the African context. Unfortunately, this is what I mentioned earlier, that the artists have got to address three entities. The self, which is the ego, otherwise the work will never come out because the artist himself has got the balance and the means to balance the work and bring it out as identical as possible to the idea that was burning within him or her. Secondly, he has to deal with the others in his own society, in his own culture, in his own kind of place, and so on. And the third is all, which is a human being all over the world. If he can hit those three bears with one, with one stone, it's perfect. But usually, unfortunately, because of lack of a tradition in dealing with work of art to be in the houses, because people usually have got their own kind of, of uh, means of expression. There's a folk art, which is there and which took over from the kind of the upper kind of uh, aesthetic kind of art, which is dealing with ideas and so on. Their art has got a function. So they are more related to the craftsman than. But as far as contemporary work, this sort of so called easy painting, this is a different level, which are not familiar, people are not familiar with it yet. And that's why they have that idea of the airport art. People who come for a short period and buy something light, whether a paper or a tiny small kind of compass and so on, and they take it home. And the artist needs to live, needs money to buy material, to get living and to have to get married, to have children, whatever it is. And that's why he has to 
deep in that. So they only dealt with the ego and, and the, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, And all for getting the middle one, which is the, the others. And this is what we tried very much indeed. That's why I, I was very much concerned to cater very much indeed to the three together, but with emphasis on the others, which is in between myself and the uh, all the human beings. Unfortunately, in, in Africa now, I remember, I tell you something. We went with uh, Professor Salah to Algeria, and we went to to to, to uh, attend the opening of a museum. They had a mall, which they turned into a beautiful, beautiful uh, art museum. And the day we went, expecting that the opening, we went early. Salah got us early to 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 wait for this uh, opening. And then when we got there, they told us that uh, sorry. It's been cancelled. The opening cancelled. Why? Everything is there. Everything is there. So no, it's cancelled. Why cancelled? Because they said the Minister of Culture who were attending in Algeria at that time thought that it's, there's no point in coming to attend an art uh, museum. So our own people <coughs> have got that effect. Sometimes I never blame them because they haven't got it. And, pressing them to, to have something. It will take time for them to come from that level of the ministerial or the kind of, uh, the proper kind of uh, facade of this and that and so on, to come to understand the real problem that we have within the society we live in. Okay, that's the last question. First of all, it's very nice that uh, your, your When I came out, from, even when I was in, in the government uh, hospitality, and they showed some of my work, they followed some of my work to show it. And when they was out, they asked them outside, where is he? And they said that uh, he has gone out for a, a mission outside the country. I showed, uh, when I came out, in little shows. Not more, because I wasn't working inside, I wouldn't uh, be allowed to have any paper or anything, or anything at all. But I was working and I had shows outside of Sudan. That time I think I had in Germany, because some of the work which I had in, uh, before and so forth. But, but, uh, I, I care a great deal. Whenever I go, I meet with artists. I visit them in their villages, in their towns, wherever they are. I go to check on my students. Who, whom I talked before, to see are they producing or not. I talk to the official, though I tell them that in a way they understand that I'm not one of you, that you have a system, I have a system, I'm not like you at all. But the thing is that something has got to be done for culture, something has got to be done for art. Recently we had my teacher, the one who taught us calligraphy, Osman Abdullah of Yahaba, who passed away and used to live work for a long time with you his last days in the British Museum. And I asked him for heaven's sake, why don't you have a museum for his work? Because they've got work like jewels. And they go, oh yes, yes, we'll think about it. And they kept thinking about it all the time. That kind of thing, I attend seminars. And I, I, I talk in the papers, and in the television, and in the radio, until I got tired. Later on, I told them that no more talk. They leave me alone, please, to carry on with my own work. And that whatever I say is just words, and that's it, nothing more. So, we try. But there is a growing movement, very much alive in the Sudan as well. 
of young artists. And they're very much consolidated, very much getting together, discussing and putting their work across. Unfortunately, the outlets are very limited because we have only, after time when, when artists got fed up with the government, which they only care for certain things and not everything, they had to make their own. One of them called Ahmed Muhammad Shibri, who had to make of his house a gallery and an art center. I remember his wife asked him, because in the house, he has two floors. And he said to her, she said to him, where will you, should we go? You want to go upstairs. So they all moved upstairs and the gallery was down below. Another one called Rashid Diab, and he made of his house a gallery. The other, uh, other uh, uh, places where you can show is only in, in embassies, French cultural center, the British Council, uh, used to be the American cultural center, and so on, the Soviet, the Russian center outside. And this is the, now they're not functioning as, as used to be said, but the French one. The rest of it is just, uh, there's no, no facilities, no museum to see. So it's all kind of self-help all the way through. But that is limited. You can't develop something nationally or throughout the country on sort of self-help. Because they have to put the money for the material, they have to put the space for rent or something. Very difficult. But there is a lively community of young artists working and producing at different levels. Sculpture, and painting, and photography, filmmaking, and so on. So with this, uh, we stop, and I really thank you so much. And so